The title of our lesson this morning is simply Restoration. Restoration. We're going to start off talking about the man whom God says, I am seeking a man after my own heart. And that, of course, is David. And he said those words in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. I think we're well familiar with the story in 1 Samuel 16 where David's brothers are paraded before Samuel. And the older brothers are big and impressive. And yet God says, listen, I don't look at a man's outward appearance. I look at the heart. And he anointed the shepherd boy, David, as the future king of Israel. We then turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And here in 1 Samuel 17, we get to see that heart that God was so fired up about. We find that the armies of Israel are stymied by the armies of the Philistines. And it was a common practice of that day. Very often, wars would be settled, battles would be settled, not by hundreds of men fighting hundreds of men, but they would send their most awesome warrior to fight the other army's most awesome warrior. And so such was the case here. We find the armies of Philistine encamped on one hill and the armies of Israel, the armies of God on the other. And every morning, the champion of the armies of the Philistines, Goliath of Gath, that's a pretty cranking name right there, <laughs> Goliath of Gath would come and taunt the armies of God and say, send out your champion. You dogs! You worms! On one such occasion, the teenage boy David hears this taunting. And he's dismayed that no one has the guts, has the courage, has the faith to face Goliath. But he goes to Saul, who was the Lord's anointed, who was physically bigger than all the other Israelites, it should have been Saul from a physical standpoint, God's anointed, God's champion, to go fight the champion of the Philistines. But even Saul was paralyzed by fear. And so David said, let me go. And in preparation, he went down to the stream and selected five smooth stones. As it turns out, that was a little over-preparation. It only took one. We find the confrontation in verse 41 of chapter 17. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked at David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome. And he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by the sword, or the spirit that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. And he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone. Without a sword in his hand he struck the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took a hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran, and God had the victory. And the church said, Amen. You see, to David, this was not about him. The diminutive shepherd boy. I like the Bible. Ruddy and handsome. This was, this was all about God. All he needed was a slingshot and a stone. And his God. David.
David saw the situation as God's battle. David saw this as a battle for God's honor. And he believed that the Lord would not let him down. And when that Philistine came closing on him, you talk about a nine-foot guy right here. Closing in on you. David, the Bible says, starts going after him. He takes that sling. You just see him just go like. And you can, you can imagine it then when he runs on over. He grabs Goliath's sword because he didn't have a sword. He grabs Goliath's sword, hacks off the head, and takes it and shows it to all the Philistine guys. Now, I'm sure he turned around and showed it to the Israelite guys too. The Philistine guy goes, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And they ran, and there was a great victory that day. It was incredible. It was such an amazing victory that Saul and the heir apparent, Jonathan, honor David in 1 Samuel chapter 18. They saw a special heart. They saw the same heart that God saw, a man after God's own heart. And yet in time, Saul grew jealous of David. Because he rose in the ranks of his army to become one of the most powerful and effective commander of all the Israelites. Things got so intense one time that he even tried to kill David with a javelin. David escapes, but only with his life. And so time passes, and we find that David is all alone. He flees from Saul. He flees from Saul's army. David is labeled an outlaw. David is labeled a misfit. David is is labeled someone that is trying to divide and hurt the kingdom. And in verse 1 of chapter 22, we read these words. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or indebted or discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him there. You know, here is, here is the boy champion. He became a commander. I mean, the Bible says everybody in Israel loved him, and now everybody in Israel seemingly hates him, and he's all alone, and he's fled to the cave of Adullam. And yet David in his mind was not alone. This is where a lot of people believe that David penned one of the most famous of his songs, the 23rd Psalm. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death. And that's what David felt like right there. I will fear no evil. For you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. I mean, the, David's enemies were all around him. He says, God, you are still taking care of me. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, have you ever noticed that when you're in an enclosure, like a shower or a cave, that your voice finally sounds good? Can you imagine someone that could actually sing, though? And as David began to sing all alone, the Bible says that his family came first. His dad and his mom and his brothers. And that's kind of amazing because there were many caves in Adam. There were many places he could be. So how do you find David? You follow the music. So can you imagine when dad and mom show up? The big brother show, oh, you came with me. Hey, man, you're with me. And he says, man, I've got, a, I've got a new song to teach you. The Lord is my shepherd. And now, it wasn't just one voice singing, but many. And people understood now that there was a, a larger battle that was looming. This was not some political battle between David and Saul. This was all about God and his righteousness. And so they, they started asking secretly, where, where is David? And the word went out, he's at the cave of Adullam. Well, where's that? Follow the singing. And every night, another would come into the camp, and another, and another. 
And the singing would grow louder and louder and more celebrated until the Bible says there were 400. Now, who were these guys? Who were these awesome guys? It says in verse 2, they were all those that were in distress, in debt, or discontented. (laughs) Wow, what a great group to have around you. They were in distress and discontented about the rule of Saul and how things were going in Israel. And they were in debt. They said, man, we're going to go be with David. We're going to go be with David. And though we are few in number, we believe this is the kind of righteous leadership we need to be aligned with. And the Bible says that in the years that came, these men who were, when they first came in distress and debt and discontented, they became David's mighty men. Is that awesome? They become the mighty men of God. Well, time passes, and we remember in chapter 24, Saul is in pursuit of David, and really challenging situation occurs in chapter 24. We find that the Bible simply says that Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. That's the biblical way of saying he had to go to the bathroom right there. And David and his men were in the back of the cave. And it was his chance to kill Saul, his enemy. And David almost did, and he cut the edge of the garment, and he was conscious struck because he was afraid to touch the Lord's anointing. And once more, he allows Saul to live. And we see this heart after God that was so noble, that was so shiny, that just stood head and shoulders above anybody else in all Israel. Of course, Saul departs more and more from the Lord. He begins even to consult the witch of Endor. And in time, he tries to commit suicide in the midst of battle. And he is killed in the battle. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, David even laments Saul's passing along with Jonathan in saying, How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Wow, that's a friendship. That's the kind of heart that David had. That's the kind of relationships that he built. We find in chapter 2 then that the men of Judah come to David. And they say, David, be our king. Because the men of Israel had chosen Isbeset, Saul's last son, to be their king. And so we find a divided Israel at this point. And the Bible says in chapter 3, in verse 1, The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. You know, in this day and age, we can look at a situation like this. We say, oh, it's just politics in Israel. We just kind of blow it off. Even now, people can be very cynical about what's going on in all the churches. Say, well, it's just church politics. And they say, I don't want to look into it. Let me tell you something. It made all the difference in the world whether you followed David, who was a righteous man, or whether you followed Saul, who was an unrighteous man. And the Bible says right here very clearly, God was with David. And he grew stronger and stronger. And the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Finally, Ishbosheth is murdered. And then the men of Israel turn to David. And they ask him to be their king as well. And so, by chapter 5, we find that Israel and Judah are united. And David is reigning as king. That's pretty cranky. Amen, guys? David's so fired up, he says, we got to bring the ark of God back to Jerusalem. So he brings the ark of God back to Jerusalem, celebrating that entry. In chapter 8, it just records all of David's victories over all the surrounding people that he subdued. I mean, in everything he did, God was with him, and God gave him success, and God gave him victory. I mean, this was an incredible man. After all, he was a man after God's own heart. And yet, we begin to read in chapter 11 of Second Samuel these words. In the spring, at the time when kings go out to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now in every age, God gives his people a mission. And right here, their mission was to conquer and slay the surrounding peoples and to Get an empire for the Israelites. 
And yet the Bible says that David sent all of his army on out, but he stayed home in Jerusalem. He was not about the mission. And when we're not about the mission, what do we get into? Sin. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. Remember, this is the anointed of God. Remember, this is a man after God's own heart. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone out to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messages to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So much for the one-night stand. You know, right here, so much went wrong. David was not about the mission. And when you're not about the mission, when you're not doing God's work, you're going to go after your flesh, after your heart. See, a lot of people get confused. I just do what my heart leads me. That can lead you into a lot of trouble, unless your heart is with the Lord. Amen, guys? And right here, he's just out, just out there, and all of a sudden, he notices this woman bathing. Watching, and he keeps watching, and his heart just is consumed with lust. And being king, he says, "Bring that woman to me." The woman he brought to him was a very special woman. Her name was Bathsheba. Yes, she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, and we find from Second Samuel chapter twenty-three that Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men. He was one of those guys that came to David at the cave. One of those guys that swore loyalty to God to the end. But she was also the daughter of Eliam. I'm going to note to a lot of people, Eliam was also a mighty man of God. In 2 Samuel chapter 23. And Eliam's dad was Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the chief counselor to David in all of his years of kingship. And so... He brings the granddaughter of his chief counselor. The daughter of one of his mighty men that is sworn by blood to be loyal to the end. The wife of another mighty man who is sworn by blood and is consumed with lust. He brings her back to him. And not by chance. She conceived a child. And we read on. Verse 6. So David sent this word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent to him David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Job was and how the soldiers were and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and, and the gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all of his master's servants and didn't go down to the house. See, David was thinking, hey, I'll just get Uriah back here. And uh, after all, he'll be back for a little break from the action, and he'll want to go home and sleep with his wife. And it, the, the baby's soon enough conceived that everybody will just think that it's Uriah's kid. Verse 10. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you just come from a distance? Why, why didn't you go home? Uriah said, David, the ark and the Israel and Judah are, are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How can I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. These are the kind of noble guys that were with David. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow and I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat amongst his master's servants. He did not go home. Wow. David tries to get the guy drunk in order to sin, in order to cover up his sin. Verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. And he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he'll be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah to a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Wow. What happens? Verse 26. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. 
but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. See, what's more, David was trying to gloss over his sin. He was trying to keep it a secret. I killed Uriah, but it really wasn't me. It was the Ammonites. It was the enemy of God. He begins to rationalize his sin. And then he says, well, you know, if I marry her right now, everybody will think, well, she just gave birth to the baby a little bit soon. And everything will be okay because no one will know anything. And yet the Bible says that what David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord knows everything. Amen, guys? And so we find this in chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had brought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man, said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Nathan placed low key. He goes, David, I got a, I got a, a situation here we need to deal with. There's, a, you know, there's this one poor guy, and he only has one ewe lamb. And he loves this ewe lamb so much. And yet, there's this rich guy that has thousands of lambs. And when this traveler came on in, the rich guy took the one ewe lamb of the poor guy and slayed it for this traveler. And David, in his so-called righteous indignation, not, not understanding that he had just heard a parable about himself, said, this guy must die. And Nathan goes, you're the man. You're the man. You know, right here, Nathan goes on and he says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? See, that was his sin. He despised the word of God. You struck down your eye the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of your eye the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one that is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret. But I will do this thing in broad daylight before Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. There is the heart that is to be emulated. Our first point is a challenging one. Evaluate your life. Evaluate your life. Where do you stand with the Lord? I mean, isn't that the most basic question of our lives? Now, some people's evaluation of the Lord begins with their heart, and that's dangerous. Because the heart is deceitful above all things, and who can know it? How do we evaluate our lives? Well, number one, through the Word of God. We have to have a standard. And number two, we need a Nathan in our lives. Someone who tells us the truth. Sometimes he maybe gets us kicked off. Do you have that kind of a person in your life? That speaks the truth and loves you? Just makes you mad? You can be sad. You can be overwhelmed. You know, you want to kick the dog. I mean, you want to do anything. Because this guy has told you the truth. And a lot of times we see this guy as an opponent. And yet, you know something that's really special? Is that later on, of course, there is consequences for David's sin with Bathsheba. The son that was conceived did die. But then they had four other sons. One is well known. That's Solomon, who eventually takes the throne. But there's also another son named Nathan. They honored God and they honored this prophet. Said, listen, we so appreciate 
you being in our lives and challenging us. We want to name your, our kid after you. Now, that's, that's pretty special, don't you think? That's how much they appreciate someone in their life. You've got to evaluate your life. You know, Jesus was always making us think about our lives. Let's go over to Mark chapter 4. In Mark 4, Jesus tells the well-known parable about the parable of the sower. He talks about how the sower goes out to sow seed, and he casts the seed out of the field, and the seed, the word of God, hits the ground and the first soil, and it's hard. It doesn't sink in, and the birds come and take it away. The seed hits the second soil, which is rocky, and the Bible says in this soil, the seed did grow, but then the sun scorched it because it didn't have any roots. The third soil, the seed was thrown, and it grew. It started to grow, but then thistles and thorns came and choked the life out of it. And then on the fourth soil, of course, it produced a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And now Jesus explains the parable here in verse 13, chapter 4. Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. So the seed is the word of God. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown on them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word, and at once they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, it lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Wow, that's a challenge, isn't it? Because you're not rooted in the Lord. Now look at this. Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. I was like seeds sown good soil. Hear the word, accept it, produce a crop 30, 60, even 100 times what was sown. You know, I think the challenge of our age, guys, is the third soil. You know, as, you know, there seems to be something in our mind that says, you know, the more I age in the Lord, being a Christian should get easier. I think that probably comes because, you know, when you first start become a Christian, I mean, you're really, I mean, you're wrestling, you're battling. And after a few months, you develop character. You know what I'm talking about? And so in some ways, it does become easier. And then I think we start to think, well, boy, if it gets easier after a couple months, man, it must be a breeze 10 years into this thing. <laughs> oh, man, for those old guys that have been around 20, 30 years, I mean, being a Christian must be an easy thing. And yet with more responsibility come more challenges. And it says right here that the word can grow, but then the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke out the word. I think that's where a lot of disciples are at is right there. And they're totally deceived. They really don't see that's where they're at. Turn to Luke 8. There's a parallel passage right here. Talking about the third soil again. I guess this gives a preacher license to be able to tell the same sermon a couple of times. If Jesus told the same sermon a couple of times, I guess we preachers can too. Amen, guys? In verse 14, we read about the third soil. It says, the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. See, a lot of people, they say, well, I'm mature, I'm mature, I've been a Christian 10 years. They pull out their disciple card. Ten years. I've been a Christian ten years. Therefore, I'm mature. Or 20 years. I'm mature. No, no, no. Biblically, to be mature is to bear fruit. Check it out. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, 6 and following. You must become a teacher is to be mature. You are to teach lost people. You must know the first principles. In knowing the first principles, you can teach others, and then you can bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times. See, we have a lot of people who are totally deceived. They think they're mature because they've been hanging around a long time. And yet when you hang around a long time, those, 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 those thistles and thorns get you. You know what I'm talking about? You know, uh, it is really awesome having my... Uh, Lovely daughter right here. And, of course, this past week with her husband, you know, we always talk about all the old stories. 
They're not old yet, but they will be someday. <laughs> and I have, I have one favorite that I've just got to share with you. It was just a few days before the wedding, and one of Santu, that's her husband's uh, relatives, he's kind of, she's kind of, I, I would say, uh, an in-law cousin, wanted to have uh, myself, my son, Sean and Eric, and my dad, and a couple of the other men in Santu's wedding party on over for this incredible, cranking strawberry festival. And we went out in the boat to her little island. She lived on an island out there in Finland. And it was, it was awesome. She greets us. She's very warm, very friendly. And we're all fired up. You know, we're ready for the strawberries. And <laughs> we're there. And, and it's kind of interesting to me. I thought, well, man, she's really reaching out to my dad. I said, that, that means a lot to me because you know how grandpas are. You know, they sometimes don't get pulled in. You know what I'm talking about. And so... I said, well, this is, this is really sweet of her. She, she has all the rest of us sit around here, but she put Grandpa by her. And so she was talking to him and talking to him. And I, you know, I am the father of the bride. And I kind of wanted to get in there and get to know everybody. And, and uh, you know, so I tried to break in one time and, and I said something. And then Bridget goes, well, let me ask you a question. What is it like? And she was talking to me. What is it like being Olivia's brother? <laughs> now, all of us start looking around because we're trying, to, we're trying to all take this in. This was a heavy moment. She's addressing me. Now, I did have a baseball cap on that covered my bald spot, amen? And we're all looking around and like this. And then, then it dawns us. She thinks my dad is Olivia's dad, not a grandma, and, and Sean and Eric and me are the brothers. The next thing, I see Sean and Eric hanging their heads. Oh, no, we're never going to hear the end of this. <laughs> you see, looks can be deceiving. <laughs> Somebody can be young and youthful and look like one well, of the brothers <laughs> when they're, in fact, the father of the bride. <laughs> see, a lot of times we can come to church. We can be singing those songs dressed up all nice big smile and we deceive ourselves on where we stand spiritually how about it? have you been bearing fruit I want to address the Portland Mission team you know next week is our inaugural service here for the City of Angels International Christian Church amen guys how about it in coming to the city have you in fact fallen into the worries of this life getting a place to stay The challenges of wealth. Oh, how much money am I going to lose if I don't sell my house? When? Just the cares of, of this world and the desire for other things. Well, I'd really like this. I'd really like that. You know, we came down here for one reason. To honor God by saving souls. Life's got to challenge you. Have you been about the mission? Or are you like Jacob? backed off the war, backed off the mission, and now you're starting to get into the tent. For some of you that have been coming out visiting, you got to evaluate your life. Not when you're comparing yourself to other people. You're always going to find someone doing worse than you. Amen. I mean, I, I was moved when Kath got on up here. We got with Louise and Kathy. We're discipling them now. I mean, Kath just poured out her heart. Not only at a sin level, but at a temptation level. And that makes me trust somebody. When was the last time you poured out your heart and you got transparent? About your life. About your marriage. About where things are at, spiritually speaking, for yourself. Because see, when, if you're in a church where there's no discipling, no daily relationship, you can live a pretty secret life. And show up on Sunday looking pretty good. Faking yourself out. Faking other people out. But the Lord is not happy. Are you with me right here? My first challenge is evaluate your life by the word of God. And secondly, you have a Nathan speak the truth and love to you. Amen? Well, you know, when David sinned, he wrote another song. Turn to Psalm 51.
you know, it, it, here, here's a, a guy that was so unique. He was a great warrior, and yet he, he, he had this ability to write and sing songs. And so having just been hit with Nathan's challenge, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. See, a lot of times when we get challenged, we say, yeah, but this person did this. My husband did this. My wife did this. You wouldn't believe the service. David didn't go into all of that. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. There's no excuse making. And he writes this song. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. You ever... Pray that prayer. Verse 6. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the innermost place. David understood it's all about the insides. It's about the inside. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and sadness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. You know, people who are not living the life of a disciple, that there's not a joy that's present. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blood out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then I'll teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will turn back to you. You know, a sign of restoration is you're just flat fired up about God. Your life is all about God. You are just so excited. It's the most exciting thing in your life. This is what was beginning to happen to David when he confessed his sin, when he repented of his sin, when he went to God with his sin. He got fired up. And then look what it says. And then I'll teach transgression ways. He says, man, i got to help out other people. And, and he's effective. And they will turn back to you. You know, if someone is really fired up about the Lord and they're saying, man, here's what the Lord has done for my life, and they invite someone out to church, that's going to hit them. But people are just so disdaining of hypocrisy. And if people pick up hypocrisy, they know if things aren't quite right. They may not be able to put their finger quite on it, but they can pick up a hypocrite. And there's nothing that's turned more people back from the gates of heaven than hypocrisy. As disciples, we got to hate the hypocrisy in our lives. Look what he says here at the very end. Verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. You know, a lot of people, when they've gone through tough times spiritually, I know this is true in my life. They go to God, and I, I know in my own life, I, I start saying, God, we, we may not go through such tough times, but God, look what we've done. I did this for you. I did that for you. I did that for you. And we start recounting to the Lord all of our sacrifices. And we're wondering, God, don't you hear me? And what happens? We get more and more self-focused, and we get more and more bitter. And then we even get to the point where we go, was it even worth it? All that I've given, all that I've done, is it even worth it? You hear Satan's voice. Walk away. It'll be easier. Find a church you can just go to on Sunday. You don't want to be invited. Walk away. But see, what God wants is not to hear about our sacrifices. He delights in a broken and contrite heart. You know what we need to do? Delight in a broken and contrite heart. That needs to be our priority. A broken and contrite heart. What is that? Well, let's go back to Second Samuel. God certainly disciplines David. The child dies. He has given other children with Bathsheba. But then he has some horrendous things happen to him. One of his sons, Ammon, rapes one of his daughters, Tamar. This causes a rift between Tamar's brother Absalom. And Absalom in time becomes so bitter 
that he, in fact, even rises up against David. And get this, he dethrones David. And David is driven out of Jerusalem by a bitter son. Wow, how hurtful. And yet even at that point, when Absalom is killed, David just cries out, Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son. Oh, David had a heart for people. You know, it's interesting, though. We read in verse 29 these words. So David mustered the entire army and went to Rabbah and attacked and captured it. He took the crown from the head of the king. Its weight was a talent of gold, and it was set with precious stones, and it was placed on David's head. He took a great quantity of plunder from the city and brought out the people who were there, consigned in the labor with saws, with iron picks and axes, and he made them working at brick making. He did this to all the Ammonite towns, and David is an iron army, returned to Jerusalem. See, after David got the broken and contrite heart, he went about the mission of God. And so a very symbolic thing happened right here. When he conquered this particular city, the Bible says there was a, there was a crown there. And the Bible says that its weight was a talent of gold. That's 75 pounds. So that's a cranking crown. Can you imagine putting 75 pounds on your head? But can you imagine what it symbolized to David? What it symbolized to his men? As, as they placed this huge crown back upon David's head, they remembered the young King David. And they said, our king is back. Because he's back fighting in the war and mission of God. What a moving time for his men. You see, we've got a delight in a broken and contrite heart and therefore go after God's will. Well, we understand what God's will is. It is the word of God, is it not? Well, why is it so important to read the will of God? Turn to Romans chapter 10. In Romans 10, there's a very profound verse in Verse 17. Paul writes, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Wow. Do you get what that's saying? A lot of people say, how do I get faith? Well, faith comes from the word of God. By hearing it preached. By reading it. You know, if you're not in the Word of God, really reading it, your faith is going to go down. You get into the Word of God, really trying to say, God, what do you have to say to me this morning? Let me tell you something. You're going to feel the faith come into your heart, and you're going to be ready to tackle your own Goliath. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, I thought one thing that we need to really just kind of lay out right here as we're starting the new congregation right here is what does it take? to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, all we want to do here at the City of Angels Church is to simply be a church of sold-out disciples. That's that's all we want to be. Some people say, well, well, Kip, why why, why do you add that term, sold out? I said, well, it's like back in 79. In 79, the word Christian was just so common, we started getting into the Word of God, and we said, hold it. Jesus says you've got to be a disciple in order to be my follower. And we found in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, that the first disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So we understood that a true Christian is a disciple. Amen, guys? And that was very important because it clarified who was lost and who was saved. Now, sadly, the word disciple has become almost as loosely used. Well, I'm a disciple. 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 I mean, we've probably got dog disciples. I don't even know. (laughs) And so we said, listen, you know, Jesus said, unless you give up everything, unless you sell everything, you cannot be my disciple. Luke 14. So what I thought we'd do right here is just go through a short discipleship study so that we can see if we're going after God's will. Are you with me right here? Go to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, this is after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus says in verse 18 to the apostles, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
Now, we always ask the people we're studying with, what does this passage teach? What does God want everybody to be? And almost every person I've studied with goes, it's easy. He wants everybody to be a baptized disciple. And the church said, how about it? Is that who you want to be? Turn over to Mark chapter 1. What's a baptized disciple do? In verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew cast a net to the left, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets, they followed him. Jesus says, hey guys, I want you to be my disciple. Come and follow me. That's the simplest definition there is to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You follow Jesus. You walk in his steps. He says, come follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And the Bible says they were so fired up that at once they left their nets and they followed him. Why? Because they saw in Jesus a purpose for their life. Is that the purpose? Is that the mission of your life? To be a fisher of men? Or are you like the passage there in Mark 4, and you, you've gotten your life so busy with other things that you just kind of push the mission on out? And you just got to ask yourself, am I fruitful? A lot of people don't like it, but that's what the book says. Is that the purpose of your life? To be a fisher of men? Let's go on. Luke 9. In Luke 9, in verse 23, it says, Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet to lose or forfeit his very soul? Jesus says, here's what's going to take fun. You've got to be willing to deny yourself, take up your cross daily. This is not a Sunday morning, Wednesday night thing. This is a seven-day, 24-hour-a-day thing. A 24-7 thing. Is that your heart? I mean, you love being a disciple. If you don't love being a disciple, you know you're in trouble right there. Because people that are in love with God love being a disciple. They love being close to God. They love that sense that God loves them and you're in his will. You love the sense that you have a purpose, that you can help other people. You can change other people's lives. You love coming together on Sunday. There's no traffic jam too big. There's no amount of distance too long that prevents you from coming to be with the brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you with me right here? Let's keep reading. Luke 14. In Luke 14, verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife, children, his brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Woo! That's a tough one. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, my husband's a Christian. My wife's a Christian. Well, therefore, this passage doesn't apply anymore. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? The Bible's quite clear. It's God and his kingdom first. Then your family. Then your job and so on. What's been taught and why the kingdom's become unraveled is we've been taught God, family, church. Now, I do believe this. Leadership is not the same as being a disciple. Leadership is not the same as the kingdom. So, very definitely, you know, you have God and his kingdom first. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Matthew 6, Remember that one, right? Amen, guys? Then your family... And then your job, and then church leadership. I think sometimes we blurred the whole kingdom thing with the church leadership, and then when everything came unraveled, we got all of our priorities mixed up, and we so overreacted to this that we have a church full of people whose priority is their physical family above their spiritual family. You know, Jesus laid it out. His mom and his brothers were ticked off at him in Mark chapter 3. They say, you're out of your mind. You know, some of us had family members that thought that about us, right? Maybe we thought that about some family members, amen? But Jesus kept his convictions and he said, hey, those who follow the word of God, they are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. See, that's how important the church is. And we've got to get a conviction to be like Jesus, and we've got to do it like Jesus did it. Are you with me right there? 
Turn to Luke chapter 11. And Luke 11 says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Follower, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. You know, right here, Jesus' disciples realized, I need some discipling. I need someone in my life helping me to learn how to pray to God. You ever had problems praying to God? That's why we have discipling, is to know how to draw near to God. Secondly, it says right here in verse 3, give us each day our daily bread. Why? Well, because from a human point of view, we need daily bread, right? And so he's saying you need to walk with God in a daily way. Now, we all understand that we don't eat just once a day, do we? We eat many times through the day, and so we need to be in contact with the Lord just like that. Are you with me, church? Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews 3, key passage about being a disciple. Verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Is that just for the leaders? Leaders see to it that no one has a sinful, unbelieving heart? No, it says you see to it. Every single disciple is to see to it, yes, in their own lives, but in their brothers' and sisters' lives. See, when someone misses church, I do believe that we follow up on them. Maybe they get mad. So what? We've got to be more concerned about them than the relationship. We can't apologize for our commitment. We can't apologize for our passion and our zeal for God. Because we want everybody to know our God. Amen, church? Yes. And let's face it. The strongest of us, wh- whoever that is, I don't know. I don't see any hands raising at this point. We all struggle with sin. Every day. Don't, don't, don't tell me you don't struggle with sin every day. Now, how, how are you going to overcome it? You've got to have disciples in your life. You've got to have disciples in your life. See, you've got to go after discipling. A lot of people want to make discipling optional. Discipling is not optional. It is of God. It's the only way to get us to heaven. It's the only way to get the world evangelized in our generation. Are you with me right here? We have got to go after God's will. Let's close out in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, we get a picture of the New Testament church, which is really what we're trying to do here at the City of Angels Church. On the very first day, Peter preached to thousands of people. And the Bible records the response of verse 41. Those who accepted this message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Would that have been a cranking first day? That's a good inaugural service right there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking bread, and prayer. I mean, these people were devoted. They were totally devoted. Now, here's the amazing thing. Notice in verse 41, it says, the 3,000 were added to their number. What's the number they were added to? In Acts chapter 1, it says the 120. The 120 are composed of the apostles, the 72, Jesus' family, who all got converted. Is that awesome or not? And the women that supported Jesus. Now, that is a cranking group of hardline disciples. And yet, when these 3,000 people are baptized, you couldn't tell the difference between the 120 and the 3,000. They were added to that number. They were all sold out disciples. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. So, our fourth point is very simple. Every day, in every way. Let's keep, keep reading. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. That's the church. That's the church that we want to have here at the City of Angels Church. A Bible church that practices what we preach. Are you with me right there? But, you know, we just can't have a collective invitation. You come to Jesus 
one by one. And you're added to God's church universal one by one. But, you know, we've got we've to really ask ourselves, am I really in God's church universal? Am I a sold-out disciple right now? Well, if you've never known the Lord, you've got to repent and be baptized. Amen? You've got to be a baptized disciple. But what if you've left the Lord? And, you know, there are a lot of people that have left the Lord and still go to church. You just got to ask yourself a very simple question. Am I living the life of a disciple? It's not complicated. Don't follow your heart. Yeah, my heart is to be a disciple. Well, are you evangelizing every day? Is that your purpose? Are you denying yourself every day? Do you have your priorities straight about God and the church and your family? Or is your life just involved in a hundred other things beside the church? Do you have your priority about your relationship with God? Is this what you're all about? Are you involved daily in a fellowship where people are in your life and you're in other people's lives discipling? If you're not, you've drifted. And shockingly, you're you're just not shopping for another church. You need to be restored. And the response is, I can't believe you don't think I'm a disciple. That's not the right heart. The heart is, I've sinned against the Lord. You turn yourself in and say, man, sorry, Lord. Forgive me. You know, I appreciate the people that have stood up here the last several weeks. Guys like Jesse and just owned it. He says, listen, I sinned. I left the Lord. Guys like Dave Swan. Even when Jason Bond, when Jason Bond came to Portland, he came from another church. And he walked in fellowship. He was there. And he goes, this is so great for me today, but so convicting because I have forgotten what it was like. And I believe that day we preached from Revelation chapter 2, where Paul challenges the church at Ephesus. He says, he says, I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Repent and remember the height from which you've fallen. You know, it really was awesome having Olivia and Santu here. If you've ever seen newlyweds. They're all, you know, like this, you know. <laughs> I have to admit, I was looking in the back seat a couple times right there. And Olivia's kiss when I go, amen. <laughs> and, you know, I go, you know, that, that, that's the way it needs to be. But, you know, and I, I, I said, you know, how about me and Elena? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can honestly say, I can honestly say, I love Elena more today than when we were newlyweds. Of course, three months into being a newlywed, she almost left me. That's not a joke. That's not a joke. That's how lousy of a husband I was. I mean, that's where I was at. I was doing lousy spiritually. You do lousy spiritually, you have a lousy marriage. But you know, I thought it was kind of cool to say, Santo and Olivia got nothing on me and Elena. You can have your first love. Don't let people say, oh, you you know, that's just baptized. You're just fired up, you know, freshly baptized people that are zealots. Let me tell you something. You can be and you should be all the more zealous. Because let me tell you something. All of us are closer to heaven than we were yesterday. Whether Jesus comes back today or whether we die tomorrow. And let me tell you something. If you're going to heaven, you need to get more and more fired up, not less and less fired up. Are you with me right here? Well, what's the challenge today? Well, it's very simple. First point, evaluate your life. E. Second point, delight in a broken and contrite heart. D. Third point, go after God's will. G. Fourth point, every day in every way. E. What's the spell? Edge. Have you fallen off the edge? Have you gotten a little edgy about being a disciple? Or are you on the edge for Jesus Christ as a sold-out disciple wanting to evangelize the world in a generation? Let's have restoration, and then this generation will be able to go to all nations. In the name of Jesus, we say amen. Amen.